Set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God I want more of you, God Set a fire down in my soul Welcome to this morning's service. It is great that you can be here with us. And can I say, Eastgate, you are looking particularly fine this morning. And uh, our building is too. And in light of the season, uh, Christmas, uh, we have thousands of LED lights all put up across the front of our building. And they dance along to music and song. And you can sit in your car and tune into the FM station and listen along. So if you haven't done that already, I encourage you to do it. Invite your neighbours and friends along. It's a free community event uh, every night leading up to Christmas. If you have been along, why don't you pop a, ch a comment in the chat box below. We'd love to hear from you and uh, hear how you're going today. Well, a shout out to all of those who today are meeting together to watch the service. And uh, it's so good that we can now be in each other's homes. And perhaps you're going on a picnic this afternoon. While our services remain online, I do encourage you to gather together in small groups and uh, for community, for relationship and for support at this time. And uh, one day we will be able to all meet back together again. Let's hear what's happening at Kids in Charge this week. It's Christmas, woo, and my heart is singing. Hi everyone, Christmas is coming. I love Christmas and I'm sorry we can't be here to meet in person and discuss all things fabulous about Christmas. But I hope that your hearts and spirits are excited too um, and that you're doing some great devotions with mum and dad or your caregivers around Christmas and Jesus coming and just that wonderful celebration of who he is. Uh, we'll be continuing with our Zooms today for Charged and for Eastgate Kids. So look out for that email and we will see you there. All right, woo, see you. We wanna say a huge thank you to everyone who has purchased food for this year's Christmas hampers. 
Today is the last opportunity that you have to contribute. And uh, so there's a little bit of time between now and 2 p.m. because we'll be down at the church and you can drop off your hampers this afternoon. We're going to partner with a number of organisations in our community this year to be able to bless families in need in our local area. Well, today we have a very special guest coming to share with you later in our service. His name is Mazza Kafali, and he's been a pastor. He's been in ministry for over 30 years. He is a well-known friend of Eastgate, and we are very blessed to have him share as we continue in our series on joy, looking at the book of Philippians. Being generous is one way that we worship God. And we're going to worship him before Mazza comes in song. So why don't you still your hearts, lift your hands, put the music up, whatever you do to be able to connect with God. And uh, we're going to sing together. Lord, we come before you. We come and we, we honour you, we glorify you. Lord, we lift up your name. You are everything to us. And today, Holy Spirit, I pray that as we focus our hearts and minds on you, as we listen to your word, would you speak to us? Would you fill us? Would you refresh us? Lord, would you open our eyes to see you a little bit more? In your name, amen. Stone, 
weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. You are Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's Till he returns or calls me home, 
Here in the power of Christ I stand Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Hi, good morning, Eastgate Christian Centre. It's really wonderful to be with you. Um, my name's Maz, and it's my privilege to be sharing this uh, final message in your series of finding joy as you've been journeying through the book of Philippians. And uh, this morning, it's my privilege to share this message about the joy of contentment. And also just to prime you at the end of the message, we're gonna be sharing communion together. So have that ready. And uh, I'll look forward to leading us in that moment. But uh, I wanna just share about this subject of contentment. I don't know about you, but it doesn't come naturally to me to be a content person. Yet what we find, not only the teaching of scripture, but in life, there's a tremendous joy and peace when we learn to live in a content manner with life, a sense of inner poise. I don't know about you, but I've got those friends who just go through life like that, even keel. They're incredibly annoying. Sometimes I've tried to deliberately throw them off that line and they just seem naturally content. That's not the case for me. And the word that we're gonna be reading about, content in scripture and Greek, conveys the idea of being self-sufficient or self-satisfied. It's the idea that a content person is satisfied with their lot in life, with what they have and the circumstances they're in. Funny story about contentment and satisfaction is our son, when he was in the seventh form at high school, was studying economics. And um, his teacher taught him this principle, and it was called in economics, satisficing. And the idea of satisficing was, to give an example, if you're studying for an exam and you do all the study knowing that you're gonna get around an 80% mark, but if you put another 10 hours of study in, it might increase it two or 3%. Is it worth doing it for that amount of percentage? So my son sat his economics exam, his teacher handed out the result, said to him, um, uh, you got around 80%, um, you could have done a lot better. And my son turned to him and said, sir, I was satisficing as you taught us. And he said, what? He said, yes, I knew if I did 10 more hours study, I'd only get another one or 2% and I wanted more time for skateboarding. So <laughs> it was, I think it was one of those moments a teacher thought, well, he has learnt the lesson, but not as I intended. And satisfaction and contentment is something we'll see that Paul says is a learnt attribute as it were. In Paul's time, the Stoics used the same Greek word for contentment, but their idea of a content person, and sometimes we see this, is that a content person was someone who eliminated all desire and all emotion from their life. And the Stoics had an exercise that they would teach people to do this. It was, if you lose or break a possession, say, I don't care. And once you mastered that, if you lost a pet, move on to animals and it died, say, I don't care. And then sadly, the third step was when you lose someone near to you and they die, say, I don't care. That is the true definition of a stoic. And that is nothing like biblical contentment whatsoever. Biblical contentment, being a content Christian, is the idea of a quiet, confident trust in God's sovereignty over my life, that he has everything under control. The world is conditioning us to be discontent. If you've studied anything about social media, you'll know about algorithms and how they're designed the moment you like something to bombard you with something similar. And the whole idea behind advertising right from its roots is to create a sense of discontentment. I'm not satisfied with this, I must have more. And it's very much happening with the advent of the internet and social media. Paul in the passages we're gonna read gives us four ingredients that I wanna extract um, very simply and quickly that I hope will help us find the joy of contentment. 
And the first one is this, it's trusting in the providence of God. So I want to read verses 10 to 12 of Philippians chapter 4. So if you've got your Bible with you, let's read along together. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned, and he says this phrase again, the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Paul's learning contentment, and the, and the phrase in the Greek language conveys the idea to learn by experience. It's not to be learned by just being informed, but Paul learned by experience because Paul had grown up um, in the lap of luxury. He'd had the best education money could buy. He'd come from a fairly affluent background as a Pharisee. And now God was teaching him through his suffering, his hardships, to learn by experience to be content, whatever the circumstance was or whatever the material needs were, whether he had plenty or he had little. And so Paul learnt it and it was trusting in the providence of God. Some people go through life as though life and the world is a machine that has just been wound up ticking along and God does not or cannot intervene or step in and change anything. Yet what we see through the sweep of scripture is God constantly intervening to arrange people and circumstances and provision, and it's called providence. It's from a Latin word, two words, one you'll be very familiar with, the word pro, which means before, and video, which means to be seen. And the idea of that is God sees before the need or the circumstance or the situation arises because he is God. He is eternal. Doesn't mean he's just got lots of time on his hands. It means God is outside of time. And so he is not affected by our time limits and he sees the end from the beginning. Isaiah tells us that he's the only one who knows the end from the beginning. And as we are journeying one step at a time, God knows what's over the horizon, what's around the corner, and his invisible hand is working in ways that we don't see to arrange circumstances and provision and situations and even people that come across our path that enable all things to work together for good. And that's what Romans 8 sums up in verse 28, a well-known verse, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It's important to read the next verse, which says that those God calls, he justifies, those he justifies, he conforms to the image of the nature of his son. In weaving everything together for good in our life, God has an overarching purpose, not just to give us good things or create good in our life, but to transform us into the likeness of Christ. So that in my humanity as Maz, I become the best version of Maz by being as Christ-like as I can in this life. So God is at work circumstantially, providentially to weave everything together to transform my life. And in that, there's great joy because I rest confident that life is not a series of accidents. It's a series of appointments. It's a series of divine appointments orchestrated by God. And one of the greatest examples of that in Scripture, and we will not read Genesis 37 to 50, but if you do, you'll read about the life of Joseph, and you'll see there one of the most amazing examples of God's providence in the life of a young man who went from being sold into slavery by his brothers to becoming second in charge in the nation of Egypt. And in all the pain and suffering and hardship he went through, Joseph developed what I've come to call over the years 50-20 vision. What's that? It's Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, in which Joseph, when he's before his brothers, who have caused so much pain in his life, says to them, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, for the saving of many people. He had this ability to look back over his life and see the invisible hand of God 
providentially weaving everything together for good. That's part of the problem for us. God sees before, for us, hindsight makes good 50-20 vision. That's why it's so important, I found in our journey, that we develop some form of spiritual discipline and practice that enables us to review our day, our week, our year, our life, to see the hand of God and to be able to rest content that God is providentially working out everything together for good. And we have many desires that we want to experience in life. Paul's contentment, Joseph's contentment, was in the fact that God was working everything for good. And our responsibility is to extract everything we can out of every situation. The great G.K. Chesterton said these words, true contentment is the power of getting out of any and every situation all there is. Or if you've watched the film Dead Poet Society, it's carpe diem, seize the day, suck the marrow. <laughs> and, and that's what we've got to do. That's part of being a content person, that I'm at rest, that God is at work, and I want to draw everything out of this circumstance and experience I can. Paul learned contentment. When Paul was in prison in Philippians 1, he says, all of this is God's purpose because my being in prison all Caesar's household and palace guards got to hear the gospel. It didn't matter. We've struggled through lockdown. Paul was in lock up. And he saw that as God's providence in his life to be able to be a witness for the gospel to people who otherwise wouldn't have met him. So he saw his imprisonment in a contented way. C.S. Lewis said an amazing thing. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy or make me content, the most possible explanation is that I was made for another world. We have many desires. I've raised four children. We now have uh, nine grandchildren, the ninth on the way. Woohoo! Shout out. <laughs> and... Uh, what I've seen is that my children growing up desired many, many things, and they wanted it then and there. They did not understand delayed gratification. They did not understand contentment. But we knew as parents, if we caved into every desire they had and gave them everything they desired when they wanted it, they would not have the character or the capacity to be able to manage it, and it would destroy them. God, as our Father, knows that. So his working everything together for good is to create contentment in us and trust in us that he is working character into us and creating a capacity within us to be able to have all the things we desire that he wants us to have. If he gave us everything we wanted when we wanted it, it would destroy us. So it's being content, content in God's providential care. Secondly, it's trusting in the power of God along the way. Verse 13, a well-known verse at many Christians quote, I can do everything through him who gives me the strength. Context is always important in understanding scripture. And the context of this verse is in the context of being content in every situation with whatever I have. And Paul is saying, I actually can do this. I've got this because God gives me the power, the strength to be able to do everything I need to do. And the word literally means to infuse with power. And it's a Greek word where we derive our English word dynamite and dynamo from. Now, I'm of an age where I know what a dynamo is on a bicycle. Uh, those of you who are in this generation of touch things, I rode a bicycle that had a dynamo on it attached to the fork of the front wheel and it rubbed against the wheel as the wheel created momentum, creating power in the dynamo that generated my headlight for my bicycle so I could ride at night. This is the image that Paul is painting when he says, I can do everything through God who gives me strength. He's using a word from where we get the sense of dynamite and dynamo, of infused energy, but it comes from our source outside ourselves. What Paul learned is that in and of himself, 
He couldn't be this kind of contented person. He didn't have the strength, the ability to be at rest in suffering and hardship, whether he had little or whether he had plenty. But he could do all things through Christ who strengthened him, who infused him, who was his dynamo, as it were, and gave him a power and a strength outside himself. And I've learned as I've journeyed that I can do all things along the way as God gives me the strength along the way as I need it, when I need it. I don't need to worry about having it beforehand. It comes along the way. Thirdly, we learn to trust in the providence of God. We learn to trust in the power of God. And thirdly, we learn to trust in the partnership of God. So let's pick that up in verse 14 of Philippians chapter 4. Paul says to the Philippians now, Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. That word share could also be translated to partake, to partner with me in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be accredited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I'm amply supplied. Now that I have received from Aphroditus the gifts, Epaphroditus, sorry, the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. That last phrase, Paul's basically saying, your giving to me was an act of worship before God that really pleased God. One of the things Paul had learnt, and I've learnt in my Christian journey, is that in life's journey, God partners with us and with his people, often through people along the way, strategically placing the right person with the right resource and provision along the way. For Paul, it was the Philippian church. They partnered with him. They saw his need. They sent him food, money, possibly clothing. God creates partnership in the journey of life, us to others, others to us. A testimony from my wife and I's journey very early on in our Christian walk, back in the early mid-80s, God taught us this lesson very profoundly. We had bought our first home, we had our first child, and um, we had uh, helped plant this church, actually. And I was at Bible school um, full, full, sorry, we're about to help plant this church and I was at Bible school full time. So we weren't getting a lot of income. And uh, we sat, it was approaching Christmas that particular year and I'd been praying and felt God prompting me that we were to give all our savings to another couple who are in another Bible school. That's one of those moments you are like, God, is that really you? <laughs> And it's Christmas time, and we've only got this much money. So I shared it with Pip, my wife, at the time. She prayed, and she came back and said, I think that's what we have to do. We withdrew all our savings. In those days, it wasn't online transferring. We withdrew our savings. We gave it as a gift to another couple in another Bible school. And then we sat down soon after one evening to have dinner. We're about to give thanks, and Pip said to me, I have $20 left for the rest of the week for food. What are you going to do? Like, what am I going to do? I'm really not too sure. We bowed our heads. We gave thanks. We prayed. And I kid you not, the moment we finished praying, there was literally a knock at the door. I didn't know who that was. We weren't expecting anyone. I got up. I went. I opened the door. And this man very nervously, a young new Christian, reached out to me, almost embarrassed, and said, this is for you. God's been teaching me about hearing his voice and giving. And so this is for you. And he then literally turned and ran down the stairs and away from our place. And I opened my hand, and there was two weeks' worth of grocery money in my hand. And that testimony still moves me to this day because it was a lesson all those decades ago of God saying, I can provide along the way. I will partner with you 
to achieve what I want you to achieve and you need to trust me. And our life has been seeing God partner with us through other people and provide in some of the most astounding ways, large things, even very little things, and enabling us to partner with him to provide and bless other people in ways that we never dreamt we could. Learning contentment is coming to a place where we realise life is about living in community and partnership. It's not about eliminating the, I don't need you, I don't care about you. It's quite the opposite. Raising four children, one of our goals was to take them from being totally dependent as a baby, moving them through the, I am independent, I will do all of this on my own by myself, <laughs> to a place of ultimate maturity to me in which I learn to live interdependent with other people. That to me creates a sense of contentment. That's God's design to live in interdependence and community. And when I trust in God's partnership, then I can be content. And then lastly and briefly is trusting in the provision of God, which in many sense, we've already covered. But just this last verse in Philippians 4.19, and my God will meet all your needs according to the glorious riches, his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. I trust in the providence of God that he's working everything together for good. I trust in God's power along the way to enable me to be at peace, content in any and every situation. I trust that God is partnering with me and others to bring about all his good purposes. And along the way, I trust God to provide whatever I need in whatever situation I find myself in. So as we wrap this up and wrap this series of finding joy up, my encouragement and challenge to us is to pray what is a well-known prayer that I would like to pray before we take communion over us. And it's often called, it's called the prayer of serenity. And most of us only know the first verse of it. I'm going to read the entire prayer of serenity as a closing prayer, which really sums up all of these um, ingredients about what it means to live in the joy of contentment. So you may wish to close your eyes. You may just wish to listen along, but I'm going to pray this prayer for you and for me in this moment. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as he, Christ did, the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. We're going to take communion now in this next moment. And so if you have the elements of communion already before you, the bread, the cup, I would like to invite you to participate in this moment. And communion, the Lord's Supper, as I was reflecting on it, provides for us the ultimate example of all these things we've been talking about. We see a picture of God's providence seeing ahead our need and providing it through Christ and the cross, his power through the cross to overcome sin and death, his partnership with us through the cross to destroy the power of suffering and bearing our sin and God's provision for our forgiveness and reconciliation with him and the amazing gift of eternal life. All of that is summed up for me in the cross of Christ. So in this moment, I want to invite you to take the bread and the cup to eat and drink. The Lord bless you in Christ's name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you.
What a great word we've had today to complete our series in Philippians on the topic of finding joy. Next week, Pastor Alan is going to start our Christmas series, Light in the Darkness. So I encourage you to tune into one of our Christmas services. We would love to see you there. On Christmas Eve too, we're going to be holding some casual carol singing gatherings around our community. If you'd like to be involved in those, you can head to the website. Uh, because numbers are limited, we do need to ask you to pre-register. For those who call Eastgate home, can I remind you all the giving options are on the website or the church app. If you'd like to set up an automatic payment, you can do it yourself directly through the online giving options or contact the church office for more details. Thank you, church, for being so generous. Well, that's all that in our service today. We thank you for joining us and we pray that you have a blessed week. See you next time.